Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast, Next, Gener Next Generation SOC Analyst Tools, Drones and Robots with Computer Vision. This webcast is presented by Security Systems News and Security Industry Association. And it's made possible by tremendous industry sponsors, Acelon and Chooch AI. I'm Joe Giddens, CS Director of Standards, and it's my pleasure to be part of this, this session today. I have just a few housekeeping items uh, before I introduce our amazing roundtable panel. Uh, this is a webcast, but what makes these special is discussion. Please don't hesitate to provide Q&A in the field provided, and we'll try to get to as many questions live as possible. Um, and we'll follow up with answers for any questions we don't have time to address. This webcast is being recorded and archived and will be accessible on the SSN and CIA websites. Uh, please look out for many more of these emerging technology webinars throughout the year. And also, please take this opportunity to download the handouts in the handouts tab to learn more about our, our wonderful sponsors, Acelon and Chooch AI. I'm extremely excited to introduce you to our pres presenters today. It's going to be a good one, I can already tell. And um, I, I can't wait for their perspectives. Uh, so we have Jim McDonald, VP of Global Security of uh, Civil Logistics, Logan Selby, Vice President of Operations at Acelon, and Michael Liu, Vice President of Strategy and Growth at Chooch AI. I'll give these, uh, these, these folks an opportunity to introduce themselves. Jim? I think Jim's muted. Hey, good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Jim McDonald. I'm the VP of uh, Global Security for SIVA Logistics. Uh, before that, I was the Director of Corporate Security for SIA LTL Freight. Again, appreciate the opportunity to be on here and to speak. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Logan Selby, Vice President of Operations at Acelon. Uh, spent most of my career in the DOD and the intelligence community. Uh, prior to coming on board at Acelon, uh, I was the executive director for Simon Property Group's Operational Intelligence Center in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, still an active reservist, so currently assigned to the 75th Innovation Command, where I am uh, one of the leaders of the robotics and autonomy group uh, under Army Futures, um, and then currently a PhD candidate in autonomous systems and robotics. Hi everyone, good morning and good afternoon. My name is Michael Liu. I'm the VP of Strategy and Growth at Chooch AI, and it's great to be here. I oversee our partnership network, uh, and it's great to have partners like Acelon and Siva. Uh, we are a broad horizontal computer vision platform uh, that we have deployed across multiple industries, including retail, manufacturing, security, and excited to be on this panel today. Uh, prior to this role, I uh, had a uh, background in financial services, having worked for Goldman Sachs and City Private Bank and I've been an active venture investor for the past uh, decade. Great to be here. Awesome, so let's set the stage with a, with a poll question uh, for, the, for the audience. So just to get an idea, um, uh, what percentage of, of SOC analysts say that they're not equipped with the necessary tools to appropriately respond to security threats? Uh, we'll keep, we'll, hopefully we'll, 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 we have an answer. This was, um, this was done by, uh, by, through research. Um, and we just want to level set what we hear, what we see from the audience to uh, what the actual answer is. So let's keep this open for about 10 seconds. Get your votes in. All right, let's check it out. So the, the leading answer was 40% uh, and 50%. There seems to be a tie there. The actual answer is more than 50%. And that's the reason why we're doing this, uh, this, this session here today. Um, and uh, just to, 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 to kick us off as to, for a little bit more background, um, you know, Logan, could you just set the, the scene for us? What are the current uh, you know, data pain points uh, that you're seeing in a typical SOC today? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so taken from my experience at the OIC, you know, managing uh, an operation for a Fortune 100 company, you know, we had a, we had a SOC there that was delivering services uh, with around 170 analysts. And so analysts are extremely inundated with tasks, you know, whether it be monitoring CCTV, answering phones um, in a call center type environment, you know, paging doors open and close, um, doing, you know, uh, assessment checks for, for different items being called in from different properties across the U.S. And, you know, we're looking for uh, um, ways to make that operation more efficient, both from the, the physical security side so on, in the field for physical security officers and on the, on the SOC side for the monitoring aspect. 
Um, so, you know, we would like to get into, you know, this slide, we kind of talk about the technology shift. So why we're here today to talk through um, how to couple uh, computer vision with drones and robotics. And, you know, in the traditional guarding sense, some of the issues that continuously arise, you know, for folks in the audience that um, are in the security industry, these are not a surprise to you. Uh, but some I like to call out is, uh, you know, high, high training costs, and that can be coupled with the high turnover rates. So in the security industry alone, when it comes to guarding or SOC panelists in general, um, there's high turnover rate, which, you know, um, there it goes hand in hand with high training costs. So you got that continuous cycle of people turning over, which pay for training costs, um, which increases your liability costs, because then you have new people coming in that you have to retrain on a continuous basis. Um, especially when you have um, security officers that are in the field protecting assets that are in public facing type positions. Everybody today has some kind of smart device on them at all times. It has a, you know, a video or a picture capability. So that security officer that is, you know, representing your asset and protecting your asset, um, they could be caught at the wrong time and it could damage brand, which is you know a huge cost and liability. Um, so that's some of the some of the points we make out. And then just the, the cost nowadays, um, you are breaching the 200k um, plus mark for a 24/7 or a 168 uh, guard position, uh, which is which is astronomical. So um, these technologies that we're going to talk about today, both drone robotics and computer vision, are are ways security practitioners can apply. Uh, these these technologies in their ecosystem to um, create an ROI and reduce costs. Um, you know, I'm glad that we're joined with Jim today from Siva Logistics. You know, Jim, you mentioned you're you're new to to Siva, but we'd like to you know, get your input on um, coming into a, a new a new environment. What security challenges are you looking to assess and address head on? Yeah, I mean, I think you made uh, several good points already. You know, for me as the quote unquote end user, it's very difficult to quantify the return on investment with the physical guard spin. Um, there's obviously, you know, operational challenges with that, um, you know, just from the low wage rate to inflation to minimum, minimum wage hikes um, to increased uh, claims. It just, you know, it all kind of comes together and it's really difficult. So even with the $200,000 price um, that you mentioned yearly, I think that that's probably just for a normal site. Um, meaning that like if you're in a market, for example, like Memphis or Chicago or Fontana, your costs are going to be even more and more, um, you know, uh, expensive. Uh, you know, you know, the difficulty in this is, is to, again, make sure that you have the proper infrastructure and whatnot, but uh, being able to, again, you know, on the opposite side to quantify the return on investment with what you can use with technology as opposed to, you know, to the guards, because, you know, what we're seeing is that, you know, with the guards, anytime that you do have someone that shows a lot of promise, um, you know, typically we're spending the money to get them up to speed and training, and then they're leaving for another job, even if it's a dollar an hour. So it's just, it's just really, um, you, you, you're constantly having, you know, moving pieces and parts and, um, you know, with, with a lot of these guards working second jobs, being um, distracted with, you know, smartphones, uh, being on the internet, and not doing, um, you know, the traditional guard tours, it just makes it very difficult. Not not only with the return on investment, but protecting both, you know, your people and you know, and your assets. Um, and again, I mean, you're just you're pulling from the same, you know, labor pool, if you will. Um, and so. You know, it's just it's 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 a battle of you know rising cost and just and again still taking on a lot of risk. Hey Jim, it's it's Michael here. Um, how I guess you know, in your role at Siva, um, how how and where are you seeing this technology impact you know operations and either like disrupt or perhaps um, fit into traditional security operations and uh, where, um, what do you think we're seeing this trend? I, I think you're seeing the trend, obviously, because, you know, um, good, bad, or indifferent, the workforce is changing. Um, technology has greatly advanced um, since, you know, what we saw 10 years ago on maybe CSI um, is now actually possible now. So for me, you know, it, it kind of comes down to just, just kind of segmenting everything, whereas, you know, you're using automation, you're using the technology. But also just as part of the cell to the C-suite is, you know, this type of um, technology is not just for security. So when you got multiple stakeholders like, let's just say safety, HR, 
um, maintenance. Um, you, you know, there's many different applications that you can use um, technology for. And again, it just continues to quantify that return on investment. I'll give you a case in point in my previous job um, dealing with um, the Memphis market, we were paying $7,500 a week uh, in guards and we were still taking on multiple claims, increased cost. And so did a $500,000 CapEx, which will pay for itself in you know, less than two years if, I, if I've done the math right and went from $7,500 a week to less than $7,500 a month. And I would argue that not only did we get a better um, type of application, but it further protects our employees and also um, assets. Because the, the thing that I would kind of give case in point with technology is technology doesn't sleep at 2 a.m. on a Saturday morning. Um, I can't tell you the amount of guards that um, that I have personally caught, you know, sleeping on the job and who, um, you know, in theory, it sounds great that they're going to do tours, but a lot of the times, you know, that's not done as opposed to using um, AI technology and using self-learning analytics to essentially cover GeoFence your whole facility. You know, to me, that's a game, a game changer. A guard is never going to be able to replicate what AI and um, the self-learning analytics can do. It's just, you know, to me, it's just not even possible. And, you know, really, I think where the disconnect is with security managers and security directors is really being able to talk the talk to C-suite. Um, because, you know, executives, you know, it really kind of comes down to money and also return on investment. So, you know, it's one thing if you say, if you go up to the C-suite and you say, you know, I need a million dollars and I need to do this and that and not really present a business case as opposed to if you say, you know, provide me with a cash infusion on a CapEx side, you know, and we'll pay for it in two years. Uh, we'll cut the cost down year over year and we'll drive that cost down. And it'll be paid for not only within a couple of years, but then after that, it's just, you know, you, you'll make some enhancements every five years and then you're done as opposed to what I mentioned earlier, spending $7,500 a week. Again, I can't quantify any type of return on investment because we were still taking on claims and guards exhibiting bad behavior. Um, and, and so, you know, for me also too, you know, on, on the claim side, what I can say with the technology is that we've been able to reduce year over year claims. So even if hypothetically speaking, you have a couple of claims that hit after you've made the investment and your and your and your uh, your monthly recurring is a lot lower, you know, you have some some wiggle room to, you know, to take on some claims and still your overall is lower year over year. Excellent points there, Jim. Um, so let's uh, let's get, dive into a few of these technologies. I know we're here to talk about uh, robotic perimeter security and uh, computer vision. So Logan, uh, can you uh, give us a, a rundown on the uh, the robotic per perimeter uh, security side of it? Sure, absolutely, Joe. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, so yeah, so at, at Aislon, you know, we tout the robotic perimeter security. Uh, we kind of built it on three pillars. So you know, when we have a uh, client approaches us about how to apply a robotic perimeter security to their asset. Um, these are the three items that we look at on, on deployment. So initially, obviously, deploying the, the asset. So um, our ground asset, which is known as Drone Dog, and then our area, aerial asset, which is known as uh, Drone Sentry. So that aspect of the pillar really creates that, um, that multi-domain operation or that, you know, that third dimension in your security depth, so that additional layer um, from an aerial, aerial perspective. Um, then the second item, the second pillar is the, the easily programmable patrols and the, the mission sets that we can establish um, pretty much instantaneously on deployment of our assets on a client site. Um, and then the third is um, really our intelligent software that we deploy um, with, um, our, or with our assets that we're deploying with our vehicles, which is uh, known as Drone IQ. And I'll get into a little bit of this, I think, on the next slide. Um, but that allows us to remotely monitor um, our capabilities and then respond and report to the client um, anything that's happening, whether that be intrusions, um, you know, video from, um, you know, any kind of incident that happened on site. Um, so this slide, um, you know, we can include some GIFs here. Um, so on the top left-hand corner, you can see that's a, that's a GIF of our uh, drone sentry taken off um, from our drone home, which is our station. 
So our drone home is really the, um, the proprietary asset in our drone core system. So as you can see there, it's demonstrating our proprietary drone swap capability, um, which really keeps our asset in the air um, around 50 minutes of every hour. So as you can see there, um, the drone autonomously lands on our station on drone home and then receives a new battery uh, whenever it runs low. Uh, and then the bottom left-hand side of the screen, you can see from a person's perspective, um, drone dog just patrolling around one of our test sites in Philadelphia. Uh, just to give you kind of a, an understanding of what that footprint looks like of that uh, uh, vehicle um, walking around on site. And you can see it ties into what I talked about before, which is drone IQ. Uh, so we consider drone IQ our central nervous system or our brain uh, of our drone core platform. So that's where um, all, the, all the magic happens. So um, everything is, is translated into drone IQ. It allows us to control all the vehicles, to monitor the vehicles, um, to set up you know, uh, waypoints, patrols, our prescriptive patrols, um, as well as review video. Um, you know, we can do it all from that single SaaS platform. That's awesome. Uh, Michael, uh, and now computer vision, can you provide an overview as to how computer vision works and, and you know, how do you see this technology improving operational efficiencies? Yeah, no. well, thanks, Joe. So um, what you see on the slide here uh, on the right hand side is a bunch of images and uh, the basics of computer vision uh, require basically a, a model to be developed. And what we say to, to our clients is that if we can basically replicate human subject uh, matter expertise, you know, using your eyes and interpreting a video or an image, and you give us enough images that represent that particular object or feature that you're looking for, we can then replicate that uh, expertise uh, into a model. Uh, we can ingest uh, not only images, but also uh, video as well. Now, what we've done at Chooch AI is we've actually solved uh, three important uh, distinct uh, bottlenecks or pain points involved with uh, edge, AI, uh, edge AI or computer vision. And one is that in order to generate these models, you need you know, thousands and thousands of images, and they need to be annotated, and it's often done by hand. It's a painstaking, manual, and laborious process, and also prone to error. And we essentially have automated that. So th that is one huge uh, time saver. The second is that we've also um, been able to create a no-code platform to develop our computer vision models based upon these images. Uh, and if you kind of uh, concatenate or add these uh, timeframes together between what we call data set generation and model training together, that typically is north of nine months in the industry. And we've been able to compress that you know, easily within a week's time, depending upon the uh, data. And then lastly, we have developed expertise at Chooch AI to actually take these models that have now been generated and deploy them to the edge. And what do we mean by edge? Next slide. We, we mean that, we, we, what I'm saying is that we can take in any type of video. It can be affixed you know, on a tripod and overhead of a door. It can come from a drone or a robot dog, which we have done, and then take that video and feed it into some sort of server that's running these models. Mm -hmm. And these servers can be either cloud-based or they can be edge-based. And 99% of the inquiries that we're receiving these days all are edge-based. And why, why edge? Why edge today? Well, number one, the devices in the field these days are actually quite powerful. So we can fit multiple models that can inference and detect objects within milliseconds for our clients. Uh, second, if, you, if reliability and uptime is critical, five nines, you don't want to have any network or cloud latency or broadband issues. So you want an on-site premise, on-premise on type of uh, inferencing. And then lastly, because a lot of the information that people gather is uh, sensitive, right? Some PI information or in a healthcare field, uh, it needs to be HIPAA compliant. We need to ensure that the data is kept private, right? And so uh, we leave these decisions in our hands of our clients. And once we've actually detected these anomalies or these objects, whether it be a hard hat or an intruder or someone who's loitering, we then send an alert out and then we, uh, and we take that data in the form of what we call a JSON uh, flat file and a JPEG, and we allow the client to then uh, store that and manipulate that. So we have wide ranging uh, capabilities. Uh, we can ingest not only traditional electro-optical um, uh, feeds uh, by uh, video or imagery, we can do thermal, uh, we can do infrared, uh, CT scan, X-ray, MRI, LIDAR, radar, We've done uh, multi-spectral satellite. We've done synthetic or aperture radar. And again, as long as we can uh, um, replicate, right, it's a subject matter domain expertise of an expert in an area right, and, and take the representative images, we can then build that data set, you know, build that model and deploy to the edge very rapidly. 
Um, as far as um, you know, how how efficient uh, we can make things um, here. I mean, we're, uh, to, to echo uh, Jim's point, um, there's there's a lot to be uh, to, to be done. I think it's very very early days. Uh, I'll bring up an example, Joe. Uh, we actually spoke to a consultant about a Middle East uh, airport uh, security uh, deployment, and uh, we kind of walked through the benefits of a uh, computer vision. And uh, the consultant said, well, I can hire 100, 150 people a day for five dollars, and to kind of kind of do this. So, like, what type of efficiencies are you going to be able to capture? And I said, well, first, you need to train them, right, and deal with the turnover issues that both the Logan and Jim addressed. Second, you need to make sure they're looking the right way. They're not texting their friends. Uh, they have to take lunch breaks. They've got to go to the bathroom. What happens if they need to now detect the Interpol 200 most wanted? How are you going to train them up? Give them a bunch of uh, photos, right? Uh, they, uh, you know, and that the, the AI it doesn't get bored. It doesn't get tired, right? The efficiency does not go down towards the end of a shift. Can't be compromised. Can't be bribed. Doesn't have human bias. And then if you're aggregating all this data across six terminals, 24/7. How can 200 guards aggregate all that data, right, for actionable uh, analysis, pattern detection, and other downstream analysis? And this is where the operational efficiencies of AI can really come into play. Right. So it sounds like these technologies, they save money, they save time, they add operational efficiency to the staff. Um, so, you know, what's what's the process for for uh, trying to, you know, put this in place? Is there is, is there a strategy? Um, you know, do you just call Logan and Michael, Jim? What, what was, how did you go through the process of, uh, of, of implementing this? Yeah, I think first and foremost, I mean, everything touches IT. So it's so crucial that, um, you know, the end user has a great relationship with IT because, you know, as we continue to evolve as a society, you know, everything requires bandwidth. And so, you know, IT infrastructure is the first thing in making sure that you have enough because, you know, uh, to Mike's point, if, you know, if all this if all this technology is going to be you know running you know off bandwidth, then it could you know create a logjam if you don't have the right infrastructure. Um, you know, for, for me, it's it's having to remain agile. Um, and and to Mike's point, you've literally taken what you know I would have seen in 2012, where you're going through hours of painstakingly you know going through video to try to find you know whatever you know, uh, particular incident that you're investigating and you're essentially using the analytics to say, hey, I'm looking for this with this specific time frame, um, you know, in this particular area. And, and then also, too, on the proactive side where it's constantly looking for exceptions um, as opposed to kind of doing old school in a manual process. And, of course, I would say part of that manual process is expecting guards to do their tours and to, you know, catch the bad guys, which... You know, it's hard for me in the 10 years that I've been in the space of corporate security, I can think of maybe one time a guard has caught um, a perp. I can definitely tell you how many times we have put people in jail with using e either thermal fence line cameras with um, analytics and AI technology or even the, um, you know, our, our cameras that geofence the, the particular facility grounds. Um, it's just, again, it kind of, for me, it comes back to, you know, return on investment. I think the key takeaway here is, is that, you know, the world is evolving right now and risk is definitely um, more inherent. Um, and, you know, I, I'd, I'd be remiss to, to, to mention that, you know, we live in this 24 hour news cycle and, um, and, you know, social media, where it's just, it just takes, you know, one particular event and it's all the way around the world, even if it's true or not. So it's just, we've got to step up our game as security practitioners. And it really kind of goes to the layered approach, meaning that, you know, there might be certain markets where you need, where you need guards, um, you know, and, and there's, and there's definitely, um, you know, in those certain markets where, where, where guards, you know, you can quantify maybe return on investment, maybe them, you know, checking in somebody inside the facility or this or that. But for me, as far as, you know, um, providing those layers, um, you know, personally, I just, I want to have as many layers as I can to, to protect both, you know, folks and assets. But, you know, Ultimately, criminals are inherently lazy. You know, they want the easy stuff. It's, you know, it's very rare that you 
at least in my 10 years where, you know, you get the bad guy, he's doing the MacGyver, he's dressed all in black, he's going through the sewer system, you know, Mission Impossible playing in the background and, you know, doing counter surveillance, you know, usually it's, 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 it's all internal or there's an internal connection. So for me, it just kind of, you know, comes down, you know, to layers. I think kind of going back to Michael's point is that what we thought was being done, you know, 10 years ago, what we're kind of finding out now is receiving the data that it wasn't actually being done. So as, as Ronald Reagan used to say, trust but verify. And having this, tech, this type of technology to key off your SOPs, um, number one, you're eliminating those false alerts that your SOC or your GSOC is, is, is inundating um, your staff with. And you're really just, you know, furthering you know, or, or nailing down um, what's actually a true um, theft event or a true incident as opposed to somebody just not, you know, following the rules. So, again, the, this the ability to be agile and, you know, again, this is cutting edge technology. So with cutting edge you know, technology, there's a learning curve. But for me, it all comes down to, and, and I would say I'm a bridge between a millennial and kind of old school, but the more data that I can have to make decisions in real time, that's what I want. I want to be proactive. I don't want to be finding out stuff that everybody else knows and then having to kind of play catch up with that. So to me, you know, that's where that's where the value is at. So yeah, I, I heard uh, collaboration and, and, and layering um, uh, as 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 part of the strategy. Yeah, every every facility is going to be going to be different and and um, from a perimeter security perspective. Uh, Logan, you've been on both both the end user and the technology provider side. So how can the two groups uh, most effectively collaborate in, in in the new technology landscape we're seeing? Sure, sure. So you know, Jim kind of hit the nail on the head. Um, you know. Keeping an open mind, understanding this is cutting edge, cutting edge or emerging technology. Uh, so understanding how to implement it, and then changing that culture. You know, once you're on ground, you know, um, trying to get the old school type mentality to accept this new technology and, and how to use it uh, to its advantage as a tool, and not see it as a as a roadblock. Um, so that that's step number one. Uh, but like you mentioned, every site's going to be different. You know, uh, from a logistic standpoint to a mall to you know, automatic auto manufacturer. You know, as you can see in these videos here, I mean, every site's going to be different. So the end user understanding uh, their priorities. Um, so initially, we when we deploy, uh, we do a thorough assessment so we can understand the priorities and the gaps that the end user is bringing us in to fill. Um, so that's extremely important. Um, the data collection, as Jim mentioned as well. You know, data now. You know, saying in the DoD is, you know, data is the new gunpowder. Um, so data is just as big as an asset as any. any line item on a financial statement. Um, so doing that data collection and then continu continuous data collection once we're deployed is extremely important for us to um, understand uh, the client as asset and get a baseline to then move forward and create our prescriptive controls for our assets to, to patrol on a client site. Um, so that kind of takes us to the second stage, which is, you know, we mentioned before, automated SOPs um, with our autonomous systems, understanding what that is. So this kind of gives you like a six-step process walking you through, um, you know, an example from our drone sentry standpoint, which is very similar to our drone dog as well. Um, but once that continuous data collection continues to occur, um, you know, we're able to uh, further automate missions and change them based on anomalies or based on you know, alarms and different changes in the environment. So um, I don't think we mentioned earlier, but you know, our devices are able to integrate into any kind of legacy systems that a, that a client may have, any type of new IoT type sensors that are available on site. And that allows us to automate a lot of these controls. So uh, as you can see, you know, takeoff, reaching altitude, performing a mission. Um, as that mission's being performed, you know, we're monitoring it remotely from our RSOC, our Robotic Security Operations Center in Philadelphia. Um, so with the integration with all those systems, whether it be a legacy system or an IoT sensor, we have the ability to re immediately respond to that during an automated patrol. So you have proactive patrols, prescriptive patrols that are based on historical data. However, in real time, if there is an a, a alarm triggered event or some type of incident that occurs, um, our vehicles are able to respond um, in real time and course correct from that current mission. Um, and then we're able to um, return to base what we call RTL, so the, the, the drone or the robot will return to its station 
um, and then perform an automated battery swap. So it's able to um, swap and then go on an additional mission or be ready to uh, respond to any type of alarm event or an occurrence. Um, so, oh, so, sorry, sorry. Um, so as you can see, you know, we have um, this is an example of uh, you know our drone dog patrolling from a POV aspect from the dog um, with uh, utilizing two JIs and computer vision technology. Um, so it gives you kind of an understanding of what that looks like. Um, so I guess I could pose another your question to Jim. Um, so you know you have tons of different applications with computer vision um, that you can apply computer vision to. Um, can you describe some of the things you're you're looking um, to be responsible with for as a security as a security practitioner for 10 years and a corporate security executive? Yeah, I mean, I think that what's really cool about this technology is the is the ability to really build it around your business. And so um, having or you know being able to um, um, have seen the drone in action with the onboard analytics, seeing the robot dog in action, um, and you know for me it's you know for example it all comes back to data collection. So the the previous slide that you showed with um, you know the vehicles, it's not just for security. You're talking yard management. Um, you know where are your high value assets if you you know misplace it because of course that never happens. Um, with this particular slide, the ability to collect vehicle tag information with the LPRs, um, you know, the robot dog being able to handle that, um, being able to use uh, thermal technology at night. Um, it, you know, again, there's not a lot of things that get me excited, um, you know, as far as with the technology field, but this right here is cutting edge. This is a game changer for, you know, for the industry. And there's just there's so much return on investment and we've really just breached, you know, the forefront of this. I mean, you know, give us another three to five years. And I mean, it's just, you know, the sky's the limit, um, you know, with this particular slide, instead of a manual process, for example, a guard going to checking on a door that might be propped open because, of course, that never happens, um, you know, um, again, with the availability of the APIs and the, and the data to be able to, to form not only the SOP, but, you know, for all these systems to be talking and integrated to, to one another, it's just taking that variable from the guard and again, trust, but verify and making sure that it's actually done because, you know, let's be honest, um, you know, the one thing that keeps me up at night as a security practitioner is these active shooter situations. And of course, you know, usually when we, um, you know, when we go through these unfortunate scenarios after they happen, what we find is there is a breakdown in security and it, come, it could be as something simple as a door being unlocked and a person, you know, um, knowing that that door has been unlocked for a certain period of time. So to me, just further, you know, automating it. And then also too, um, you know, from more of a, a practical standpoint, the ability to um, archive an event because we live in a very litigious society now, you know, from the safety compliance and risk management um, perspective, you know, it's, it's crucial to protect your brand and your company against, you know, litigation. Um, and so what a better way to say, you know, hey, here, here's here's the video and here's the analytics doing everything that it's supposed to be doing and, and here's why we believe that, that we're right with this particular incident. So I yeah, just want to, um, you know, just elaborate on some of that, those real world scenarios. I know you've already discussed some of the major aspects of how computer vision works, Michael, uh, but can you speak a little bit more about what, how that comes out in, in, in the real world environment some considerations, some controls, some threshold confidence levels. Really, I'm talking about uh, kind of false alarms, um, and, and you know, how, how how can you ensure that SOC analysts aren't bombarded by false alarms with this type of technology? Yeah, no, no thanks, Joe. It's, it's a great question. Look, look, look the, the real world has rainy days, right? It has low light conditions. It's got crappy cameras, and it's got fast moving objects, right? So not everything's going to be a picture perfect uh, scenario with uh, with great uh, lighting conditions. So you know, uh, within a computer vision world, we need to ensure that we have the right type of gear, right, uh, as well as uh, and, and properly situated at the right angles too, and, and in the right places. So, 
whether that's a X number of camera deployments, whether it's a, an upgrade of existing cameras from a 720 to 1080p or a higher frame rate, or maybe for every five visual cameras, we need one thermal camera, you know, for uh, night vision operations, surveillance, right? But what we're trying to do, to put another way, is we're taking the world of visual data, which is currently unstructured, and we're actually putting structure into it by identifying all the different objects, you know, in the scene that are of interest to, uh, to, to, to folks. Now, to answer your point here, um, AI in some ways is kind of dumb. Right, we can detect objects, but we need rules on top of these uh, of these detection models in order to make sense of them. So if I told you I can do weapons detection and you're uh, monitoring, um, you know, security, you know, within a Walmart, and you see people buying guns near the uh, the, the the guns counter, that that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? But on the other hand, we have perimeter security in the parking lot, and you see someone getting out of their car 50 yards away from the entrance of Walmart with a long gun, right? Then we have an issue. Right, so so we need some logic um, on top of that. Uh, other situations, if you're detecting uh, and want to ensure that people are wearing hard hats on a construction site for their safety, what happens if someone takes off a hard hat for eight seconds to wipe their brow because it's a hot day and it puts it back on? Should they be terminated? Should they, should their manager you know get an alert saying that there was a safety violation? Right, or take an example of uh, security in an airport um, and you're detecting unattended luggage. Well, you have, to, you have to run a couple different uh, models here. You have to make sure you know what luggage looks like. You have to know what a person looks like to make sure it's attended. And what's the definition of attended? Is it three inches away? Is it touching it? Is it a foot away? And then when they start walking away, how far away do they need to be before it's unattended? And if it's unattended, how long do they need to be away? Right? Is it 10 seconds? Is it 30 seconds? Is it a minute? And then what happens if their friend comes and takes the luggage and brings it to the gate because they're stuck in line getting coffee. So there are other considerations and, and rules and logic that need to be applied on top of AI. And this is what we and our partners do to actually make the AI effective. So in the world of anomaly detection, whether we're detecting uh, open doors or intruders or people loitering, we need to ensure that we uh, impose some additional logic on top of that so that we don't get overwhelmed. If someone fell down, do you need a constant alert saying that someone has fallen down, like they're not moving? Right. Hopefully you've noticed that the AI notices it and then the EMS has been alerted and is sent along the way. Right. So same thing with fire and smoke detection. If someone you know, lights a lighter, that's, that's technically fire, but it's hooked up to someone who's smoking. Well, maybe we don't call 911 for that. Right. So or someone if there's a small fire, as a, another example, and is snuffed out by someone with a blanket in like 15 seconds, maybe we don't have to call uh, the authorities right away. So. Again, I, I do emphasize that we need to have some logic on there to prevent a lot of uh, spurious uh, data overwhelming uh, analysts. Uh, as far as your last question regarding accuracy rate, uh, here at Chuch AI, uh, I mentioned earlier, we develop models quite rapidly and quickly. We do not release them unless they have at least a 90% accuracy. Otherwise, we don't feel uh, confident that they're gonna be effective uh, in, in the real world. Great. So I know the, the, the last part is, you know, so all this, you know, you're detecting things, um, you're, you're, you're running, you know, missions and, and, and uh, routes, but once you get to the point where you put it all together and you receive the alert, um, uh, obviously there, there's uh, some human interaction to proactively respond. So can, can you guys uh, take, take turns going through this last step of, uh, you know, what happens after an alert is received? Sure. I can take that. Yeah. So, um, you know, after an alert is received on, on the SOC analyst aspect, you know, depending on um, prioritization, you know, we have um, protocols set in place, whether that be automated protocols or protocols that the analysts follow themselves. Um, so that could be something as like a pop script that allows them to understand what the next step is to take. Um, so we're kind of taking the guesswork um, out of the equation for the analysts as well. So an alert comes in, um, a pop script is generated to tell them what to do next. Um, so whether that is, um, you know, they hit a certain threshold where that's contact local law enforcement, or that is um, a th certain threshold that tells them to contact a call tree for that client that they're um, overwatching. Um, so really, it, it just becomes a, a decision tree for the analyst once that alert comes in. So that's why, you know, creating more efficiencies and reducing the amount of um, overabundant alarms for the analyst is extremely important in the problem that we're, we're solving. 
Yeah. And I mean, just to add to that, you know, every market is, you know, is unique in itself, you know, so obviously a Fontana, California and Dallas, Texas is probably going to be different than, you know, Dothan, Alabama. I mean, the, the, the good news is this is all customizable. Um, what, what is really good about this is the fact of that you are providing real time data to your SOC analyst to where they can make the best possible decision as opposed to kind of what we did 10 years ago, old school was just there at a computer screen for 20 minutes. And then after that, you checked out. So I think that that's where the, the, the return on investment is, is just, is just tweaking it to markets, you know, you know, specific, like, you know, for example, um, in, in my previous job, you know, for me, the, the caveat wasn't always to put the bad guys in jail. The caveat was to protect the employees. And so if it meant that, you know, that the analyst finds a, a true identifiable threat and then using an IP, um, you know, speaker system to, you know, administrate voice challenges to get them off the property, you know, to me, that's still a win because trust me, um, the, these, you know, the bad guys are, are, are letting their friends know that, you know, X, Y, Z place is not the place to, um, you know, to be trying to, um, you know, steal, you know, steal stuff or, you know, or whatnot. Um, so I, I think that that's what makes it, you know, so unique is it's customizable. Great, right, Michael, any, anything to add? Um, no, I mean, it just, uh, just can, you know, if you think about um, a guard's role, right, you think about surveillance and enforcement, you're kind of, with this technology, you're kind of shifting more into the surveillance mode, right? I mean, there's some tasks that AI and robots really can't uh, perform, right? But at least from a surveillance perspective, you kind of lightened that load a little bit and made that traditional aspect of a guard's role um, a lot more automated, a lot more efficient and much more scalable too, right? If if you have some really good practices that have now implemented in computer vision models, you can now scale that across thousands of cameras and get that degree of consistency that you may not get, you know, with a very varied uh, guard force. Thanks for that. Um, so as, as, as the CEO's director of standards, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about how you put this together technically. I know there's um, probably some clear, clear, uh, clear standards and, and, um, and, and how, do, how, do, how do you put these technologies together effectively and have them work the way that they're supposed to? Uh, I'll so kick I'll it off, Joe, and uh, just, okay. just, re just really brief, briefly, um, when we detect uh, an anomaly or an object uh, of interest, uh, we uh, that data is easily accessible in a JSON and JPEG file, and that's easily accessible via API or MQTT broker, or we can just send out an email or text alert uh, with you know very very little integration. So all of our partners have found it actually quite easy to integrate. Sorry, Jeff, go ahead. Uh, no, you're fine. Um, so I, th you know, the thing I, I think is most important here from if you're just a security manager, a director, a VP, is being able to understand that Rome wasn't built in a day. So in my previous job, it took me close to nine years to get us up to this point of the type, type of technology that we're talking about today. And so a lot of that starts, you know, with funding and, you know, um, you know, just because your C-suite says no one day doesn't mean that they're not gonna say yes, you know, the next. And it's just being able to create that business case of, you know, it's not just we just want some toys to play with here. It's we really want to find a return on investment, drive down overall cost and provide a better product to both um, our employees and our customers. So I, I think it starts with that and being able to talk the talk. And again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, being able to, to go and show the business case and how the, you know, the numbers make sense, because, you know, even with the case in point that I gave about um, the Memphis market earlier, um, you know, yeah, five hundred thousand dollars seems like a lot of money. But after you've taken on two massive claims and you're paying seventy five hundred dollars a week, um, you know, it's really it's really a no brainer um, of you know what the decision you know needs to be. So, you know. For me, this is an easy sell. Um, it's just, you know, planning it out strategically, understanding that it's not going to happen overnight, you know, and just, you know, continually and just, and just realizing that it's just not one stakeholder that this is benefiting from. 
you know you can use i mean just for example you can use the drones for yard management i mean on top of you know looking for security exceptions and you know safety so it's just really getting the buy end of you know all your all your constituents if you will and just making that business case and just to, just to echo um you know the two gentlemen statements you know um as far as asalon goes you know our platforms are open as well so um, we're accepting about other uh, technology platforms and we can integrate with a lot of legacy platforms as well. And you know, to echo Jim's statement, you know, the, the, the culture side of things, I, I understand from experience can be extremely challenging as well. So getting that buy-in is extremely important. And, you know, especially when, we're dealing, when you're dealing with drones and robotics, um, you know, putting some robots uh, on, a, on a site um, can be intimidating to, to not only, um, you know, the security practitioners, but the staff in general. So, you know, having that narrative and, being able to explain to folks, you know, what what the mission is, what they're being utilized for, um, is extremely important up front as well to get the to get the entirety of the buy-in from from the organization. Okay, so let's let's take them time now and, and, and do a, a second poll. Um, so in, in addition to security, which areas do you see drones and robotics? Uh, with computer vision providing significant value, and Jim, you mentioned you know using the drone for yard management as, uh, for 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 uh, as one example. Anything else come to mind as to you know what you what how you see this going? I mean, the main thing that comes to mind is is this is how you make your business case. This is how you get your funding by involving other verticals of the business or other stakeholders. So for me, it's it's an easy answer. It's all the above, because you know. Um, Again, technology does not sleep. Um, it's constantly looking for exceptions. You, there, there's no other type of product right now that is gonna give you this type of coverage um, of what you're gonna get with AI and self-learning analytics. Yeah, and it really does seem that the, the audience does agree with you um, with, with, with all of the above. Um, so let's shift gears a little bit. I think I'm, let's do a, a little bit of a, a uh, lightning round in terms of uh, security workforce of the of the future. Um, so I'll go around, and then you know it'll also give the the audience some time to to um, to submit some more some more questions. Um, and when you, when you look ahead at the security workforce of the future, who is it? What are they doing? When are they doing it? Where? Why? Uh, Thirty seconds each. So Logan, how about you? Sure, sure. So, you know, when it comes to in the drone and the robotics industry in general, you know, people see robots as replacements for humans. And, and I definitely don't see that as, as the case. I, I feel it's, this is adding opportunity for current security practitioners to take on a different, different role in the administration aspect of drones and robotics or the monitoring aspect of drones and robotics. So, you know, I see the security workforce of the future as individuals that's in the workforce now that, you know, wants to gain an additional skill to be able to manage and apply these assets. Michael, how about you? I kind of concur with uh, uh, Logan's comments. I think it's going to be a, a happy coexistence. I mean, there are some things that robots and computer vision can do just better and faster than humans. I mean, if there's 300 people in the crowd, by the time you kind of count the four, I've, I've already got 300 all counted, of which 60% are women and 30% and are wearing red T-shirts or so. So um, I think there's some functions that you should leave, but there are other more sophisticated functions from SSC personnel that, frankly, uh, I don't really foresee robotics or computer vision uh, overtaking anytime soon. They're just too complex at the current state of technology. Uh, so I do kind of see a nice complement uh, of both the technology and, as well as the best of what uh, the traditional um, SSC analysts and uh, guard force can uh, provide. And Jim, what does your team have to look forward to? I mean, I, just to keep it, you know, stupid simple, I, I don't know if it's the logistics space, you know, as a whole, but anytime that you're comfortable, that's when you're not growing. And so I think it's easy to, you know, use the old adage that this is the way we've done it for 20 years. So why should we change? Um, you know, message for me, when I came into the space from law enforcement, I, I just made the decision that I was gonna be a change agent and that I was gonna make calculated risks to better enhance our security platform. Um, because for me, at the end of the day, um, I, everybody that comes into work, I want them to go home, you know, safe and secure. And so I, I just, you know, for me, um, you know, although the guards do serve a purpose, uh, for me, the best product and application for for what we want to do here now at SIVA 
um, is is to use you know cutting edge technology and, and and to be frank you know our customers are are you know are asking more and more you know for this so I'd rather be on the forefront and our customers feel like that they're getting the best in class security offering and that we are doing everything possible to mitigate risk and also brand protection from both Siva and you know our you know our customer so you know and just to add on something to what you know michael said and 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 mike i'm kind of curious you know what you think about this but i i really think this type of technology is good is really going to significant significantly reduce risk when it comes to active shooter I, I i think that it might be a little early but i i really think that the layered approach along with this type of technology specifically um you know being able to point out weapons and you know and you know um you know items that can hurt people obviously i i think this is going to be a game changer i really do uh, what do you think uh, i actually do agree with that point jim i mean if you think about you know, the, the ability for a camera with you know high definition and range to actually detect objects in the distance that perhaps can't be resolved with the human eye or looking at a large field of vision where it might take three or four or five people to constantly look without blinking, right? 30 seconds is a long time. 30 seconds is a long time for an EMS response, right? And if I can detect one person coming out with a handgun in a parking lot versus two people with a long gun and body armor, right? You're gonna have different type of responses and you're gonna have different scenarios for casualty rates potentially as well too. Right, which means you need to get the right type of uh, enforcement out there ASAP. Right, if you now couple that with an, either an aerial or automated uh, uh, deployment of video through a robot dog or a drone or so, it's going to make that whole coverage even more effective. Right, so I, I do agree, and I know 30 seconds may not sound like a lot, but you know, in these type of scenarios, every second does count, especially when people's lives are at stake. Absolutely. And it can protect the, the first responders too. So you're adding, you're lengthening the chain of events. So, you know, if a, if a drone responds or a dog responds with the ability for two-way audio, you know, that, that's going to be a distraction or a deterrent from that person and maybe make them think twice from committing that violent act as well. Um, so, you know, the first responder aspect, you know, you're reducing the potential violent act from occurring. Hey, so I think we have some time for uh, for Q and A. Um, I have one that's really focused on um, <clears throat> on on a, on a false alarms. Um, so uh, let me try to condense this a little bit. Uh, a CCTV with with uh, with certain algorithms is only seeing what it's seeing. Otherwise, too many false alar uh, alerts occur. So no AI system is 100% foolproof, no matter how good the algorithm. Environments change globally. And all considerations and, and simulations need to be run, which never happens. So, what are your thoughts on on, on that in terms of those simulations and how um, you could, what what's done to reduce those false alarms? Uh, well, the, that's a good point, and, it, and it's better to have false alarms than, than and than ones that you totally miss, especially in mission critical situations, right? So, to have a, a false alarm or, or, or false positive, if you will, and then having someone just double check. That, that's the worst case scenario. Okay, nothing really bad happened, right? What would be worse is if you had like a false negative and you did miss something and the door was open or someone did have a gun, right? So you probably want to err on, on more on the false positive side than the false negative side. Um, at Chooch AI, once we, we, we try to take as much uh, real world data that, that is available uh, and we do a, a fair amount of interesting uh, techniques that actually simulate edge use cases and increase the variety and diversity of the data set. Uh, that means we'll grayscale our, da our data set, we blanch them, we cut them out, we reverse image, we try to create a, a multitude of different uh, images to actually help build that model. We then potentially augment that with real world data, right, and, and then test it on real world data. So once the model's kind of built out, we'll actually run it, you know, using kind of a crappy 720 CCTV ca uh, camera and see how it goes. And if we're getting a multitude of false positive and negatives, we take that information, feed that back into the data set, and actually try to improve the model. Uh, and whoever asked that question it is correct. It is not going to be 100%, you know, but neither are humans. Humans make mistakes all the time as well. Right. I and here's one uh, probably more getting to more um, a more uh, targeted to Logan, but uh, we would like everyone's uh, opinion too. What is the what does the group think about the emergence of airspace security, uh, you know, drone detection, drone detection and mitigation, and its impact on SOC operations? Sure. So that, that's a that's a 
question that we hear regularly at a salon so uh, definitely definitely a threat um, you know as you can see um, in you know recent news overseas it's becoming a, a larger and larger issue um, probably only a matter of time before it becomes a larger issue in the US um, I mean there's a, a airspace um, incursion events that happen on a regular basis with you know small private UAS systems um, so I would say yeah, yes it is an issue uh, you know we uh, at a salon currently uh, are you know, partnering with other organizations that are looking at combating those issues along with our platform. Um, so it is something we hear on a regular basis, but I'll open it up to uh, the other gentlemen to see you know, their, their thoughts. Yeah, I mean, so for me, I think that there's obviously inherited risk with anything that you do. Um, I, I, you know, a lot of it is just, you know, going to be, you know, governmental control, um, partnering, you know, as Logan suggested, networking, you know, all the above. I, I just think that right now as it stands that this type of technology is not going to go anywhere. So I, I think just the governance part of it, that's what, you know, needs to be worked on. But, you know, I, I would, you know, make the business case that here in the U.S., you know, it's a lot different compared to overseas with the type of problems you know that they're having with drones so you know for me i think it's just inevitable you know with uh, the amazons of the world delivering um with domino's pizza using the um you know the self-driving vehicles i just think it's inevitable that we kind of you know kind of you know kind of like how we laugh when we watch the jetsons what you're kind of seeing is the world transforming into that we have time for a quick one, um, and it's, it's kind of related. So, how do the drone, the drone flying regulatory requirements, um, you know, on the local, state, and federal level, um, and the regulatory headwinds impact the feasibility and viability of the related AI technologies when you combine them? So, we're currently combating that uh, on a daily basis. So, uh, we're applying for our uh, Beyond Visual Line of Sight waivers currently with the FAA. Um, submitting our first waivers here in the next couple of weeks actually um, so it's a continuous process so we have a pretty strong partnership with the FAA um, a lot of our advisory board uh, members come directly from the FAA so uh, we have a, a straight partnership right now in order to combat the regulations uh, we do have safety pilots that reside on site uh, but we still are controlling all of our flight operations from Philadelphia remotely uh, but we have that part 107 FAA card holder on every site that we're deployed to currently and Michael, your platform is is kind of dispatch agnostic, correct? It it is. So if we uh, ingest um, a video, whether it be a real time stream from a drone, or it's downloaded, or we await the, the drone to be docked and then that download the uh, video, um, is it's, it's all somewhat similar. Um, I, when it comes to um, exportation of uh, geospatial AI capability outside the U.S., that 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 is certainly regulated or so. And of course, anytime you talk about AI and surveillance, uh, the privacy issue always kind of comes up or so, which is a whole separate topic. But uh, you know, these are things that we're certainly sensitive to here at, at, at UJI. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you so much, Logan. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, I think we have to leave it there to, today. Uh, we have, uh, here's your, your contact information for anyone that has questions directly to them. Once again, thank you so much for the engaging um, audience participation. We really do appreciate that. And we'll reach out to answer any questions that we that were, were missed. Um, and thank you once again to our sponsors, uh, Acelon and Chuch AI uh, for making this event happen. Um, that concludes today's presentation. Everyone be well and, and see you next time.